Thank you very much, Miguel, for all your for sharing your very recent results. That's very kind. Could if you could please take place, and, and I hope we can connect Kim back. I, I hope it works. Uh, I don't know. You you you, you choose for. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. Can uh. I also maybe see you? Is is it possible? <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> I, I, I never did a hybrid panel discussion, but, but let's start. We also see you a bit smaller down. <laughs> so maybe to start with, with a question that was already raised by some of the um, attendees um, and, and that um, both of you have actually touched a bit. Um, so both of you are relying on simulators and, and you were trying to replicate what simulators already can. Um, but how about problems that are not yet captured um, by, by simulators or by, by the underlying laws? So, so how are you um, trying to, to bridge that gap to, to the real data, capturing real data, learning from real data, learning from real problems? You already did the, the real experiments, which was really nice to see. So at least you, you did the transfer in the other direction. But how about bringing kind of starting from data from real observations. Who of you would like to start? <laughs> Kimberly, would you like to start? Um, sure, yeah, okay. I, I actually, I think uh, it sounds like Miguel will have more to say about this because you've actually <laughs> already done some of these experiments where you have a loop with experimentation and trying to make the experiments you do count and like make that dimension maximally efficient. Um, I think for us, a big motivator has been to have an approach that can, in principle, be trained from data, but the current pipeline we have, we're using classical simulators to produce the training data and all of our, our training data and all of our methods, therefore, ultimately inherit from a simulator. Um, I think um, my, my background, um, my, like my PhD was in neuroscience, and so for me, a big motivator is if you want to get into biological data, um, a lot of these domains, we don't have the kind of simulators we have for fluid dynamics. Um, you know, we know the Navier-Stokes equation, which governs fluid dynamics. We don't have uh, equations by and large that capture um, the dynamics of the brain or what, um, what kinds of dynamics are observed during a seizure. Um, so I think uh, the, the key challenge there um, as Miguel outlined, is just that these real world experiments are very expensive to run and machine learning classically is really data hungry. Um, so I think the key issue would be trying to minimize the actual number of experiments that you have to run and really pick and choose what you need to parameterize your model. Um, so, you know, step one maybe is having an approach that's general enough to learn from real world data and then step two is make sure you don't need an amount of data that is just not actually tractable to obtain. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to, to Miguel now. Thanks, Kimberly. I don't, I don't have a lot more to, to add. I, I, I agree completely. So I tend to see the problem in, in two ways. The first is um, whether or not you can actually use machine learning to augment the solvers. So sometimes, for example, in our case, in material modeling, the constitutive laws, meaning the material behavior locally, is pretty challenging already to, to get with standard models. So machine learning could kind of help fill in the gap. And then you let the, the, the solver do what it does well, which is dealing with geometries and different phases and so on and so forth. So this is one, one approach. The other is as well what, what Kimberly mentioned, which is you can hybridize or use multi-fidelity, where for example, you have data that comes from experiments, which is expensive and you can only have a few data points, and data that comes from simulations that are imperfect because the solvers are not perfect. And, and then this way you actually both mix the two things together with an appropriate multi-fidelity machine learning model and, uh, and, and basically get hopefully better performance in, in practice. And, and we have had a little bit of success in doing that uh, in, in some of these cases and sometimes we also fail miserably. <laughs> And one topic that came up in both of your um, presentations was, um, on the one hand, generalization ability, but also extrapolation ability. And particularly in your talk, Miguel, um, extrapolation ability was, was a, bit, uh, a big topic. 
um, it, it seems like you, you were able to, to solve that, which is really one of the challenges of machine learning. How do you extrapolate and how do you go beyond your, your training data set and how do you generalize to something that you haven't seen? Is this a, a general recipe that you applied? It seems to work for this specific um, application. Um, do you have ideas on how to transfer it to others? Okay, that, that is a really great question, actually. And I, I'm afraid to disappoint you, but uh, I don't have a general answer for that. I, I th we believe that we have a decent answer for the material scenario, but even in that sense, there are limitations. For example, um, the, those representative volume elements usually are assumed to have periodic boundary conditions. So we exploited the fact that they have periodic boundary conditions to, to using uh, fast Fourier transforms, FFT. And this kind of really speeded up the, the solving part. Teamed up with uh, unsupervised learning, we could actually have few clusters in the right place, then solve with FFT and get a, a pretty good uh, extrapolation uh, abilities. So, but this, as, as you mentioned, this is not general for all of your problems. Sometimes FFT is just not possible. Sometimes putting in Fourier space is really not the way to go because you don't have high frequency signal. And, uh, you know, if, if you do have uh, the general solution, uh, please talk to me, because I'd be very interested in, in actually getting to it. But I think there are many ways that we can get there, but the general way, we'll see. <laughs> How about you, Kim? So you mentioned generalization ability, you evaluated it, it was, it was performing differently for different models, extrapolation was, was not dependent on, on which of the models. Can, can you comment a bit on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I I also do not have the general purpose <laughs> solution to generalization in machine learning. Um, it's um, it's a really hard problem. I think um, it. Uh, I, I I talked a bit about generalization, particularly as it relates to design problems, um, because uh, you at least the way we have things set up, where you have a a learned model and an optimizer that's trying to um, find the region where the learned model. Uh, thinks that it's going to get maximum reward, that you're you're very susceptible to generalization issues. So things like active learning to make sure that you are knowledgeable about the part of the space that your design is in can be really useful. Uncertainty is really useful. Um, and um, in, in our case, I think having a model that generalizes um, at least along the dimensions of variation that we were exploring um, was useful. So I think like one, there there's many different ways you might want your model to generalize. I mean, the challenge is that it is fundamentally not determined by the training data. Um, and so if you have uh, some pre previous knowledge, like local rules are going to be what govern the physics of the system, then you can build a model that learns the local rules and that has some chance of generalizing. Um, similarly, if you know something about the, the constraints of your system, um, if you have a physical system about which a lot of science is known, then you can use this to, um, you can bake this into your system. You can have these hybrid approaches that Miguel was mentioning and potentially have a more, a, a wider window that your model will cover that where your fewer things are, are determined from the data and therefore only to be trusted in the regime where the data has spoken. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I basically think it's, it's a huge problem and that the, um, that we should be really, that we should be very mindful of it. Um, and I, I think like in addition to trying to get models that generalize based on whatever prior knowledge we have about the domain that we could possibly think about using, um, a good approach is just knowing when your model is uncertain, when, when maybe an ensemble of models disagree or restraining your models to, to stay in a part of the space where you're reliable about. Um, this is one of the reasons we thought that the ensemble models were probably helpful in the case of the airfoil optimization. We forced many models to agree on a solution, um, which can, can be one way to, to mitigate this out of distribution challenge. Thank you very much for outlining this. And it's actually connected to one of the questions from the audience, and it's exactly on their uncertainty estimates, but also on finding out when the models are incorrect, so going in the direction of ensembles. Is this one of the ways that you have been solving it? Um, and are there any other ways, are there any other recommendations kind of how to find out if your model is incorrect and how to, um, how to guide the models um, in, in the right direction of, of, of learning? 
Yeah, maybe Miguel, you could yeah. take over, and then um, if Kim has can add something. Sure. Um, I think uncertainty quantification is is incredibly important for engineering. It, it really, really is. So this ability of of saying when you don't know, and to say when you do know, and um, and the problem, of course, as you probably know better than I do, is that Bayesian machine learning is very slow. So it's very expensive to compute. And then, of course, what, what seems to happen is that you have a big spectrum of possibilities. So you can ensemble, which in practice works very, very well. It's a very effective way of, of doing it, like Kimberly was saying. I couldn't agree more. So it's a very simple, similar, simple technique where you, you basically have a bunch of models, right? And you, you can just group them, an ensemble in, in French, right? And, and, and just average the behavior. But sometimes it's also not very high fidelity. So we have some examples in, in the group, unpublished at the moment, where we're trying to characterize the different possibilities. And in practice, it really depends whether or not that, that works for you. But then, of course, you can go more and more complicated and, and do uh, inference in, in, a, in a more expensive way, but then the dimensionality of your problem shrinks. So. Frankly, I think that in terms of machine learning development, personally, I think that Bayesian machine learning has a long way to go. And uh, I, I find it super exciting to try to contribute to, to that field and, and, and together with the community. I hope this answered the question. Yeah, I, I guess so. It was a question from the audience. Um, would you like to add anything, Kim, to in, for uncertainty quantification? Yeah, essentially, I mean, I, I, I basically agree with what was said. I mean, I think that um, the thing that is great about ensembles is that it's very simple. Like you just take whatever you were doing um, and you do that same thing a larger number of times. Um, and you can take that as a distribution. You can interpret it as a distribution and the properties of a distribution, like statistics you might want to compute, like averaging or standard deviation to get an, a proxy for uncertainty. You can apply these to your distribution of estimates. Um, it's very simple. It seems like it, it works sometimes and it doesn't really fundamentally change anything about your pipeline, which is really nice. However, it is not the same as uncertainty. And so I, I think this, especially for applications where you really need to rely on the solution, like engineering things where you're going to Build a bridge or something like you really need to trust it, and I think these more computationally expensive methods um, that are still like largely in development, like the, the Bayesian treatment of uncertainty, is probably going to be really useful there. I think where um, you you can't necessarily um, guarantee that the way that you vary parameters to get your ensemble is actually leading to a spread of outcomes that's representative of the true distribution. So it works a lot, um, and it's it's useful for a lot of things. But um, but whether it's like you know truly trustworthy, I think more sophisticated treatment of uncertainty would be really helpful for them. Thanks for this. Um, there, there was a question from the audience that is a bit related to um, our point that we touched before on um, just getting data from simulators. Um, so the question is, in the case of elasticity to um, inelastic deformation, would there not be an opportunity to run um, time-elapse CT scans to generate training data as perhaps as higher accuracy and volume um, than the finite element solvers. Is, is that something that you considered or that you considered collaborating in case you were, you're not collecting data yourself? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful question. It, it also ties in with, the, with this idea of multifidelity where absolutely it is a great idea to, if you do have access to that data, if you do have the experiments that are Really, you know, they are actually showing you the real process. And if you can actually infuse that in the learning process, absolutely do it. Uh, why not? It's just uh, additional high fidelity data, high quality data that you should indeed include in, in the process. We, in the context of simulating materials with plasticity, we haven't done it. I don't have a, an experimental group, <laughs> so, but uh, I would be actually very, very interested in, in getting into it. But certainly there's a lot of value in doing that. I, I fully, fully agree. Thanks a lot. And um, I will take one question to, to Kimberly as well. 
Um, can the graph-based approach be applied to situations where the initial conditions are only partially known? For example, to be able to discover the actual boundary conditions from sparse measurements, for example, discover the actual pressure field and aerofoil shape from only a few sparse surface measurements um, going in the direction of inverse problem. Um, yeah, so I think this is a, a different kind of inverse problem where you might want to say, um, I have a couple of measurements and I want to try to infer the rest of the design. Um, I think that the graph-based approach could in principle be, but that basically the, the pipelines we have for doing this um, are, are sort of like um, perception as inverse graphics where you have some observations and you want to try and infer what the rest of the picture looks like. Um, and there's methods that are you, where people use deep learning to do this for images. And I think the graph-based approach could be useful for doing this on graphs where you have a small number of measurements for certain nodes and you train some graph neural network to go from partial observations to uh, a full view of what the input should have looked like that generated those observations. Um, this is um, uh, not something that we've worked on specifically, so it might have some problems. Um, I think in general with these type of inverse problems, the key challenge is resolving the ambiguity of the inverse problem. Um, whereas in our case, we don't really know whether the, the ambiguity um, going from the, fat, the target to the input was really the key challenge. Um, in theory, information can be lost when you go from the initial conditions to the final position. Um, and if so, the model is capable of resolving that, but we were more interested in challenges about like the, the long time scale of the rollout um, and the complexity of the physics rather than the specific problem of resolving ambiguity, which you interact with more in this type of problem and long rollouts are not necessarily a, a huge problem here. Um, so I, I think basically the, the direction that I'm uncertain about this type of approach working like this particular model would be if other things are required for the ambiguity resolving step of inverse problems. But I think adapting this to graph-based rather than um, image-based data um, should be should be doable in principle. Thank you very much. Um, we're already actually uh, above the time, and um, we, we could be discussing for, for, for hours, I believe. Maybe we should have organized for one day, not for half a day. Uh, but still, be before we, we, we leave here, I would like to ask you one question. What, what makes you currently the most excited about uh, in the current developments, the current methods? Because a lot has been happening. So what's, what's the most exciting um, development that you have been tackling or that you were excited to start? Um, Miguel is already waiting to her, so please, please start. <laughs> um, a collaboration. Okay. I think um, the, the idea that we together can do better than individual research groups. This is something that I'm really fascinated about and I hope that it will come to fruition because I think mechanics, unlike computer science, is not open. So it's not common to have uh, data sets being shared, um, models being open source, um, and, and, and that uh, sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that we as a community change and that we actually kind of uh, uh, start sharing and, and, and building on each other. That's a very nice uh, ending word. Kim, what's your ending word? <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I found your continual learning section um, just honestly really inspiring. Um, I think for um, me, my word will be open-endedness. Um, I think the thing that I'm really excited about with these physical engineering domains is that they are so varied and human behaviors in these domains are so complex and have created technologies so powerful that I'm excited for I'm excited basically to challenge our machine learning methods to try and be sophisticated enough to do this kind of stuff. Um, I think it's just a, a, a great challenge. Thank you very much. And um, um, please join me giving a round of applause to both of the speakers. It has been really great following your work, but also for the discussion.